Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Sam Crow here, bringing you part two, or actually more likely the conclusion, of our first lesson of the U.S. Constitution at the What's Up Bro Law and Justice show. Hope you guys had a chance to catch that episode. If you didn't, go back. It's available now for you guys at your favorite streaming service and on our YouTube channel. This is a great way for you guys to keep uh, complimenting your notes and to finish off your notes. As you recall, and I'll re recap just briefly in case you're just tuning in new here and haven't heard the first episode, we did the first lesson of our Constitution course, which we're going to be doing over the next uh, several weeks, I would say maybe several months, depending on how quickly we get these episodes out. And to finish off the lesson that we did yesterday, uh, I we started reading, there was an article that was published there in the first lesson, which there is a test on, and if any of you, again, have the ability to get some of these resources and want to take the test on your own, you can. We're just sort of reading through it just to help you guys take some personal notes and write things down. It's going to help you, or help us rather, go through this course and learn together. So we did get through most of the reading. However, because of time and it took a long time, we decided to take a pause. I did put the bookmark in, which I'm going to take out here. So I am going to finish reading this article for you guys. That's all we're going to do right now. It's going to be short and sweet and to the point. That way you guys can finalize your notes if you've been taking them and get ready to prepare for the next course. We're going to do course uh, lesson number two on our next episode when we do that. So let me pull that up here. I have it bookmarked, I have it signed, sealed, and delivered. We're on page, okay. I just wanna re recap this article for you guys just in case, again, if you're just tuning in here. So this is, again, the first lesson of our Constitution course brought to you by um, theamericanview.com. It is the Institute on the Constitution. We did share the links there on our social medias. You can check that out, all sorts of resources there. You can get this course specifically if you want your own hard copies of it. You can also uh, purchase other books and downloads for supplemental resources. You can go peruse that, check it out. It's available for you guys all over there. Uh, a lot of great stuff. We highly recommend you check it out. You can get a subscription there. By doing that, you're also giving a monthly donation to help further the cause and grow and support this grassroots education system, which you can do. So if you feel led to do that, we appreciate that. You can definitely – there's different tiers you can contribute to. You don't have to give a whole lot, but it's a little bit – every little bit that helps and that counts. So check that out. There was one other point. I just had it and I lost it. What was I going to say here? Um, oh, shucks. I lost my train of thought there. It'll come back to me, I'm sure. It was, some, it was in regards to... Oh, yes, there it is. As I said, come back to you. We also did share the links, which we probably will share that again in this for this episode too, in the episode description and on the YouTube video when it goes up on our YouTube channel. Check out that link in the description for the actual video lecture, which is available on YouTube. And that is some experts who are talking about this first lesson and going over the, the visual aid part of that. We just sort of are reading the material from that. So you can check out the actual lecture there. You might get some better notes for that as well. So if you want to check that out, those links are available. Actually, I think we were going to share that. We, might, we, we did share that. I will, we'll make sure we get them on the studio on all of our uh, social media accounts just so you guys can check it out further after I post this episode here. Uh, so just to recap... This article is written by Joseph Sobran back in 2005. It's totally his. It's not ours. We're just reading this. This was available through the course. The article is titled, How Tyranny Came to America. And again, we started reading through the majority of it. You can catch that in the last episode. So we're on the latter half of this reading. I want to finish this off where I bookmarked it from yesterday, which we're on this page right here. Uh, and just want to recap quickly, too, and say a lot of strong words that he did share. I hope you guys are taking... A lot of great notes for this. I mean, a lot of things I remember from reading, a lot of new things just from, you know, refreshing and going it, but doing this. But a lot of great things we talked about. And the, I think the most interesting thing I commented on this yesterday as well, which I'm probably going to comment again at some point based on the rest of this reading, how much for the time this was written, almost, let's see, about 18, maybe 18 years ago, how prevalent a lot of this information is that we're living today. Because some of the things that he talks about are. 
things that potentially could happen during that time frame back in 2005 to some of the things that actually have happened right now in 2023. So it's very interesting. Hope you guys catch that little correlation there, but it's really neat. So let's read this. Again, have your notebooks ready. Make sure you have your notes there. You can capitalize on that and finish these off and be prepared for the next lesson. So starting from page 16, which is where we left off. So the New Deal didn't just expand the power of the federal government. That had been done before. The New Deal did much deeper mischief. It struck at the whole principle of constitutional resistance to federal expansion. Congress didn't need any constitutional amendment to increase its powers. It could increase its own powers ad hoc, powers ad hoc, which is very important if you've taken a history class or law class. That's a subject that's talked about in there. It's Latin for that one, but I don't remember what it means exactly at this moment, but I remember taking it for the college class I took. At any time, by simple majority vote. Now, again, we're talking about this is all including in our Constitution course, lesson number one. This is all paramount and prevalent to this. There's a great lesson uh, t- test on this article, so this is why we're reading this too, just so you guys can take some notes. And again, if you get the resources yourself and want to take that test, as of now, we're not taking any quizzes or tests at this point. If it seems like we need to, we will try to incorporate that. We just want to get the information down first, so that's all. But at your own discretion, at your own leisure, if you want to do it, you guys are welcome to do so. All this, of course, would have seemed monstrous to our ancestors. Even Alexander Hamilton, who favored a relatively strong central government in his time, never dreamed of a government so powerful. The court suffered a bloody defeat at Roosevelt's hands, and since his time it has never found a major act of Congress unconstitutional. This has allowed the power of the federal government to grow without restraint. At the federal level, quote-unquote checks and balances, has ceased to include judicial review. This is a startling fact. Flying as, if, flying as it does in the face of the familiar conservative complaints about the court's quote-unquote activism, when it comes to Congress, the court has been absolutely passive, as if to compensate for its habit of uh, capital, capital, capitalization. Again, these are big words. I usually can get these, but capitalization to Congress. The court's post-World War II quote-unquote activism has been directed entirely against the states, whose laws it has struck down in areas that used to be considered their settled and exclusive provinces. Time after time, it has founded quote-unquote unconstitutional laws whose legitimacy had stood unquestioned throughout the history of the republic. Notice how total the reversal of the court's role has been. It began with the duty, according to Hamilton, of striking down new seizures of power by Congress. Now it finds constitutional virtually everything... It finds constitutional virtually... It finds constitution now it finds constitutional virtually everything Congress chooses to do. And again, some of the times I have to make sure I make these words sound like they're working together. When I read this, I can't always see it quite here. The federal government has assumed myriads of new powers nowhere mentioned or implied in the Constitution. Yet the court has never seriously impeded this expansion or rather explosion of novel claims of power. What it finds unconstitutional are the traditional powers of the states. The post war court has done pioneering work in one notable area the separation of church and state. I said, quote-unquote, pioneering, not praiseworthy. The court has consistently imposed an understanding of the First Amendment that is not only exaggerated but unprecedented, most notoriously in its 1962 ruling that prayer in public schools amounts to an, to an quote-unquote, establishment of religion. This interpretation of the Establishment Clause has always been to the disadvantage of Christianity and of any law with roots in Christian morality. And it's impossible to doubt that the justice, justices who voted for this interpretation were voting their uh, predile- predilection, predile- predilections. Again, I'm usually good with big words. Sometimes I have to take a minute. Maybe that's the point. I've never heard it put quite this way, but the court's boldest ruling showed something less innocent than a series of honest mistakes. Studying these cases and others of the court's liberal heyday, one never gets the sense that the majority was suppressing its own preferences. It was clearly enacting them. Those rulings can be described as wishful thinking run amok, and uh, touched with more than a little arrogance. All in all, the court displayed the opposite of the restraint and uh, impartial temperament one expects even of a traffic court judge, let alone a Supreme Court. It's ironic to recall Hamilton's assurance that the Supreme Court would be, quote-unquote, the least dangerous of the three branches of the federal government. But Hamilton did give us a shrewd warning about what would happen if the court were ever corrupted. In Federalist Number 78, he wrote that, quote, 
Liberty can have nothing to fear from the judiciary alone, but would have everything to fear from its union with either of the other branches, end quote. Since Franklin Roosevelt, as I've said, the judiciary has in effect formed a union with the other two branches to uh, aggrandize the power of the federal government at the expense of the states and the people. This, in outline, is the, un is the constitutional history of the United States. You won't find it in the textbooks, which are required to be optimistic, to present degeneration, yeah, I said that right, degeneration as development, and to treat the su successive pronouncements of the Supreme Court as so many oracle revelations of constitutional meaning. A leading liberal scholar, Leonard Levy, has gone so far as to say that what matters is now what the Constitution says, is not what the Constitution says, but what the Court has said about the Constitution in more than 400 volumes of commentary. This can only mean that the commentary we, uh, has displaced the original text, and that, quote-unquote, we the people have been supplanted by, quote-unquote, we the lawyers. We the people can't read and understand our own Constitution. We have to have it explained to us by the professionals. Moreover, if the court enjoys oracle status, it can't really be criticized because it can do no wrong. We may dislike its results, but future rulings will have to be derived from them as precedents, rather than the text and logic of the Constitution. And notice that the quote-unquote conservative justices appointed by Republican presidents have by and large upheld not the original Constitution, but the most liberal interpretations of the court itself, notably on the subject of abortion which I'll return to in a minute. Now, I just want to pause there again. We did mention this yesterday when we did the first, uh, the main episode for this course. Um, this is just a viewpoint shared here. And again, we're not trying to start arguments and we're not trying to get people upset for that. This is just what this course is teaching. You guys are certainly welcome to explore on your own. We always welcome different viewpoints and opinions there. This is just a staple and a statement of some other researchers and folks that have given their opinions to their works when they've written these down or when this course was built and so forth. So just want to preface that by saying that. So just so you guys understand that it's not that we're trying to attack anybody specifically. This is just viewpoints that we share here and that we want to share with other people. So just so we clear that up. To sum up this little constitutional history, the history of the Constitution is the story of its inversion. The original understanding of the Constitution has been reversed. The Constitution creates a presumption against any power not plainly delegated to the federal government and a corresponding presumption in favor of the rights and powers of the states and the people. But we now have a sloppy presumption in favor of federal power. Most people assume the federal government can do anything it isn't plainly forbidden to do. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments were uh, adopted to make the principle of the Constitution as clear as possible. Hamilton, you know, argued against adding a Bill of Rights, on grounds that it would be redundant and confusing. He thought it would seem to imply that the federal government had more powers than it had been given. Why say, he asked, that the freedom of the press shall not be infringed when the federal government would have no power by which it could be infringed? And you can even make the case that he was exactly right. He understood, at any rate, that our freedom is safer if we think of the Constitution as a list of powers rather than as a list of rights. Interesting point there. Be that as it may, the Bill of Rights was adopted, but it was designed to meet his objection. The Ninth Amendment says, quote, The enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people, end quote. The Tenth says, quote, The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it, by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people, end quote. Now, what these two provisions mean is pretty simple. The ninth means that the list of the people's rights in the Constitution is not meant to be complete, that they still have many other rights, like the right to travel or to marry, which may deserve just as much respect as the right not to have soldiers quartered in their one's home in peacetime. The tenth, on the other hand, means that the list of powers, quote-unquote, delegated to the federal government is complete and that any other powers the government assumed would be, in the framers' habitual word, quote-unquote, usurped. As I said earlier, the founders believe that our rights come from God and the government's powers come from us, so the Constitution can't list all our rights, but it can and does list all the federal government's powers. You can think of the Constitution as a sort of antitrust act for government, with the Ninth and Tenth Amendments at its core. 
It's remarkable that the same liberals who think business uh, monopolies are sinister think monopolies of political power are progressive. When they can't pass their programs because of the constitutional safeguards, they complain about quote-unquote gridlock, a cliché that shows they miss the whole point of the enumeration and separation of powers. Well, I don't have to tell you that this way of thinking is absolutely alien to that of today's politicians and pundits. Can you imagine Al Gore, Dan Rostenkowski, or Tom Brokaw having a conversation about political principles with any of the Founding Fathers? If you can, you must have a vivid fantasy life. And the result of the loss of our original political idea has been, as I say, to invert the original presumptions. The average American, whether he has had high school civics or a degree in political science, is apt to assume that the Constitution somehow empowers the government to do nearly anything, while implicitly limiting our rights by listing them. Not that anyone would say it this way, but it's as if the Bill of Rights had said that the enumeration of the federal government's powers in the Constitution is not meant to deny or disparage any other powers it may choose to claim. While the rights not given to the people in the Constitution are reserved to the federal government to give or withhold and the states may be progressively stripped of their original powers. What it, comes to is, what it comes to is that we don't really have an operative constitution anymore. The federal government defines its own powers day by day. It's limited not by the list of the powers in the constitution, but by whatever it can get away with politically, just as the president can now send troops abroad to fight without a declaration of war. Interesting. I didn't realize that actually that's a re refresher for me there. Because if you went back in the day, actually, I'll, I'll just a little footnote there for that. It was uh, the duty of actually Congress... The president could, could implore Congress to send troops, but only if it was an act of war that was declared. So even the president had to go to Congress, who had to check him before the troops could be sent out. So that interesting point of fact there. Specifically World War II, I remember President Roosevelt doing that, so that's where that kind of points in that direction. So again, even I still learn something every day. That's interesting. Moving on here. Excuse me, I have to... Oh, I had a I burp there. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Excuse me. Congress can pass a national health care program without a constitutional delegation of power. The only restraint left is political opposition. If you suspect I'm overstating the change from our original principles, I give you the late Justice Hugo Black in a 1965 case called Griswold v. Connecticut, and I read this for a class too. I don't remember the notes. I have them somewhere. But the court struck down a law forbidding the sale of contraceptives on grounds that it violated a right of quote-unquote privacy. This supposed right, of course, became the basis for the court's even more radical 1973 ruling in Roe v. Wade. But that's another story. That's a huge story in itself. And if you guys want, this is not a shameless plug, but check it out. There is a movie based on that. It is available, I believe it's on HBO Max. Maybe it's Hulu. I'm not sure. Check that out if you want a visual aid better for that. I haven't seen it entirely, but from what I read, it sounds pretty interesting to tie into this story. But you can also read about Roe v. Wade. It's easy to find, too, if you want to do it on your own time. Uh, the case dealing with abortion and so forth. I'll just give you that preface there, so check it out. Justice Black dissented in the Griswold case on the following ground. Quote, I like my privacy as well as the next man, he wrote, but I am nevertheless compelled to admit that government has a right to invade it unless prohibited by what specific constitutional provision, some specific constitutional provision, unquote. What a hopelessly muddled and really sinister misconception of the relation between the individual and the state. Government has a right to invade our privacy, unless prohibited by the Constitution. You don't have to share the court's twisted view of the right of privacy in order to be shocked that one of its members takes this view of the quote-unquote right of government to invade privacy. It gets crazier. In 1993, the court handed down one of the most bizarre decisions of all time. For two decades, enemies of legal abortion had been supporting Republican candidates in the hope of filling the court with appointees who would review Roe v. Wade. In Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the court finally did so, but even with eight Republican appointees on the court, the result was not what the conservatives had hoped for. The court reaffirmed Roe. Its reasoning was amazing. A, plur a plurality, yes, a, plur a plurality, if I'm saying, again, I'm trying my best, this English is hard sometimes, some of these words, opinion. A majority of the five justice majority in the case admitted that the court's previous ruling in Roe might be logically and historically vulnerable, but it held that the paramount consi uh, consideration was that the court be consistent and not appear to be yielding to public pressure, lest it lose its the respect of the republic, 
Therefore, the court allowed Roe to stand. Now, why this is interesting, quick pause here for you guys, and as you all probably well know by this point, over the last six months, I think it was in the last six months now, I lose track of time, but the Supreme Court had recently overturned this ruling. So I find it interesting that this gentleman had wrote all this down, and this is a viewpoint that was shared. Now, this is almost 20 years ago, mind you. So you see the growing trend of how much our society laws change. You know, America's ever changing there. Why? Same thing. It says the Constitution needs to be, you know, open because things will change. As far as well, this is talking about power in that one section, but things can be changed based on. See, let's start from my microphone. Sorry, the growing change of times and the trend of everything happening. So it's very interesting to kind of go back and see this to realize where we are living now and reflecting back. I thought it was very interesting. Maybe a lot of you guys did too. So just wanted to point that out there specifically too. Among many things that might be said about this ruling, the most basic is this. The court, in effect, declared itself a third party to the controversy, and then, setting aside the merits of the two principles, the principal's claims, ruled in its own interest. It was as if the referee in a prize fight had declared himself the winner. Cynics had always suspected that the court did not forget its self-interest in its decisions, but they never expected to hear it say so. The three justices who signed that opinion evidently didn't realize what they were saying. A distinguished veteran court watcher, who approved of Roe, by the way, told me he had never seen anything like it. The court was actually telling us that it put its own welfare ahead of, its, ahead of the merits of the arguments before it. In its confusion, it was blurting out the truth. But by then, very few Americans could even remember the original constitutional plan. The original plan was as Madison and Tocqueville described it. State government was to be the rule, federal government the exception. The state's powers were to be, quote-unquote, numerous and indefinite. Federal powers were, quote-unquote, few and defined. This is, a matter of not, uh, this is a matter not only of history, but of iron logic. The Constitution doesn't make sense when read any other way. As Madison asked, why bother listing particular federal powers unless li unlisted powers are withheld? The unchecked federal government has not only overflowed its banks, it has even created its own economy. Thanks to its exercise of myriad unwarranted powers, it can claim tens of millions of dependents, at least part of whose income is due to the abuse of the taxing and spending powers for their benefit. Government employees, retirees, farmers, contractors, teachers, artists, even soldiers. Large numbers of these people are paid much more than their market value because the taxpayer is forced to subsidize them. By the same token, most taxpayers would instantly be better off if the federal government simply ceased to exist or if it suddenly returned to its constitutional functions. Can we restore the Constitution and recover our freedom? I have no doubt that we can. Like all great reforms, it will take an intelligent, determined effort by many people. I don't want to sow false optimism. But the time is ripe for a constitutional counter-revolution. I had to take a minute to look at that word. Discontent with the ruling system, as the 1992 Perriott vote showed, is deep and widespread among several classes of people. Christians, conservatives, gun owners, taxpayers, and simple believers in the honest government all have their reasons. The rulers lack legitimacy and don't believe in their own power strongly enough to defend it. The beauty of it is that the people don't have to invent a new system of government in order to get rid of this one. They only have to restore the one described in the Constitution, the system our government already professes to be upholding. Taken seriously, the Constitution would pose a serious threat to our form of government. And for just that reason, the ruling parties will be finished as soon as the American people rediscover and awaken their dormant Constitution. And that ends the reading. I gotta say, guys, you know, and as I said, we don't, uh, we don't want to say we want to start debate and start war with people here, but these are some pretty powerful stuff when you really look at it. And I, you know, I, when you think about it, these type of things need to be said, especially in our day and age in this generation. Now, it talks about that. In essence, what I've always said, too, is how government doesn't seem to work anymore, and it's not for the people. We look at everything now. Inflation is high. Taxes, you know, we're – and as this article points out, too, it's not about recreating the system, in essence. It's just about getting back to the original roots, which is why – we're doing this course to help educate you guys listening to this to understand that this is the way we want to go. This is not just for us, it's for the future. 
And again, it doesn't mean we all have to agree. The simple rule of life is because all of us as uniquely as, as humans are, we're not all going to agree on the same thing. It's just simple logic for that. And that's the reason why our nations can be divided too because everybody has their own viewpoints. Everybody has their own agendas. It's very rare. It's and actually probably never happened and never going to happen that we are all going to agree on the exact same thing or be on the same side with everything. So that's just the point of fact of that's the nature of the reality. Uh, so just to kind of put that out there. But, you know, the other interesting thing, <coughs> excuse me, is, as I mentioned just a bit ago too, I, I just still can't fathom it. The thoughts that are in these words that are shared, and this is throughout the whole course. I mean, I know this is talking about this this uh, article that we're reading here that's part of this first lesson. But, and I'm sure we're going to see this rather too as we go through this course. This course was designed such a long time ago, and some of the things we talked about are probably going to be things that you're going to see that already have happened. As I mentioned just moments ago, too, the Roe versus Wade. That has been a controversial case for decades, and only until recently. It's still causing controversy, but the Supreme Court actually overturned it finally. So when you see things like that, it's just interesting. And the other thing is, and I wanted to make a comment as I was reading that, too. It made me think of it, too. The, the biggest thing that we still have issue with and our government has is balance of power but the argument between federal and states rights you know the federal government says we have this much power the state says yeah but we have this much power and the government uh, the federal says we can do this the state says no you can't because we're our own you know we're united but we're individual states the simplest way to put it right and if you've ever thought about that for just a moment it might sound crazy it might sound silly goofy you can put any of your own words to that but bottom line is when you break it down, you can really see how much the system can deteriorate and why it has. And it's more than anything else, hidden agendas. And as this case, which is interesting, when we read the article talking about how the Supreme Court, even you know, supposed to be fair and just in the land, has its own interest in some of these cases and some of these issues that happen upon their rulings and so forth. Uh, it's really hard to find complete fair, fair and optimal and... Uh, a truthful resolution to resolve conflict and issues. Now, I'm not saying this to be an anarchist, and I'm not saying this to cause drama or cause issues. It's just more thought-provoking than anything else, and that's what we're trying to get for you guys, trying to do that. So, you know, really think about this as we go through this course, and when you research these, if you do on your own, or if you, you know, get some supplemental things, or you read some other, you know, make sure, that's why I said too, take a lot of good notes, because this stuff is really powerful. This really has some level of true understanding for that where you know we can we can really learn something and whether or not you share the same viewpoints and I'm sure a lot of you might not and we totally can respect that. Again, we're not trying to uh, alienate anybody and we're not trying to offend people and we're not, you know, doing this for the sake of doing it and we're not doing it to you know, just start a revolution or a movement rather, but this is just educational purposes. And I think the core thing, and I've said this and I'll keep saying it because this is the foundation of what we use for this course. It's just to be thought provoking is at the very least to get you guys to think about these things and really explore on your own and question it yourself. Don't just be oblivious to it. That's a better word than ignorant because ignorance is part of it. But a lot of times it's not always ignorance. It's oblivion. People just don't bat an eye or don't look in that direction. So we just want that to be the case where you guys at least think about these things. And that's really the preface of this whole, the point and basis of this whole course where we're doing this for this podcast anyway, is to educate and to really help everybody get a sense of your rights and all the things that accompany with that, you know, and, that, and, and the like. So we're just here to learn and to grow. And what you discover on your own or what you find is entirely up to you. But that's just something that we hope, you know, for all and everybody that goes through this course that we just want to make sure that we are together at least to the point of knowledge and knowing that the given rights that we've had as Americans, we take full advantage of that. And most importantly, we protect ourselves because we are, are we the people have the power in manner speaking down the road uh, ultimately. So which a lot of people seem to either take that lightly, take it for granted, or don't take it at all. So that's the point and message of this, and that's what we're going to do as we continue on and grow. 
So that's going to do it for you guys, uh, for us, for guys, for this episode. That just want to get that final reading out, especially to help you guys, like I said, get your notes together. So go back. If you need to listen to this again, you can check out the Institute on the Constitution, theamericanview.com. We'll post links there. Again, we'll post the links, too, for the video for the lecture for this first lesson. If you guys have a chance to do it, it is on YouTube. Check it out. It might be able to help you fill out your notes even more. And then we're going to prepare then to do another episode, hopefully soon. I'm not sure how quickly we'll get to it, but I want to take some time for you guys to really chew on this and do some of your own exploration. But we're going to get to lesson number two. We're going to recap a bit of this lesson and try to tie everything together and see what else we have to grow and learn from as we explore the wonderful document of the Constitution, as well as a little bit of the Declaration of Independence that this fits in there too, and just the rich heritage and history of this great culture so that we can truly be patriotic Americans who really respect and enjoy rights, liberties, and freedoms for all. With that in mind, guys, have a great rest of your week. Have a great weekend. Make sure you check, you tune in tomorrow night and Saturday. All new episodes of the What's Up Bro podcast show. Sam Crow, myself, and Big Hoss will be live. Some of our friends may be joining us, some of our other staff members. Never know who's going to walk through our door, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be entertaining. You can always count on that. We're looking forward to that. We hope you guys have a great rest of your, your work day if you're working still or whatever's going on. If you're relaxing finally, that's great. Looking forward to the weekend. We're going to help you kick it off in the right way, in the right manner. And then, of course, we'll give you guys updates as far as when the next episode will launch. Hope you're enjoying this course here at the Law and Justice Show. Can't wait to do more with you guys. Have a great one. Have a great week. We, I say goodbye for now. We say goodbye, actually, rather. It's our typical moniker there. But, of course, we always say, too, it is goodbye for now. Until next time, though, when we see you at the show. Thank you.